How about you join me in a time of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We honor and glorify you and are so appreciative. And I want to we want to focus on the, the fact that you really did send your son down here on earth to die for us. So that way our sins are cleansed and we can come into your presence and experience your grace day after day. And Lord, we don't take that for granted. We begin to just understand how, who you really are and, and, and the qualities and the characteristics that you have that are bestowed onto us. And so we can be more like you each and every day to extend that same grace to other people. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the people who are watching, Father God, that the ones who took the time out to join us today to experience our service and for the ones who may be joined that may be hurting, Father God, we touch those people as well. We lift our hands and towards those people and, their, and to heal their hearts. And if they may have lost something during um, the time that we've been, you know, just in the home and trying to be safe, Father God, we pray that you bless them back in double, Father God. You give them what they lost and you restore their hearts, restore their soul, restore their minds and wherever they're needing peace in. And so, Lord, we thank you for the word coming forth today as Pastor Hunt. He, he teaches us and he gives us things that are that are plain and easy to understand. And so that way we can understand who you are more and more deeper and move in closer to you. So we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this moment. We appreciate who you are. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Miracles when you move. Such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. Still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. Your voice is calling me out. And right now, I know you're able. And my God, come through again. You can do all things. You
going on, man? Hey, man, it's a beautiful day, Bobby. It is a beautiful day. Nice day for just kind of hanging out, relaxing. Okay, cool, cool. I'm glad you're doing that. You need to do that. Yes, sir. Don't have to study or read or <laughs> get ready for any messages right. or anything. Right, huh? right. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, uh, I've been listening to your teachings the last few weeks, and, mm -hmm. you know, you really got me thinking about this whole dust and dirt and I started studying and I, I ran up on a script and I just wanted to run it by you. See what you think about it. I know so, you, I know so, you. <laughs> so you're going to make me work I anyway. Know, huh? I know. I, you know. <laughs> okay. What's the scripture? Well, it was in first Corinthians 15. And so it said, so it is written, the first man, Adam became a living being. The last Adam, a life giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. So I was just really trying to connect the dots. I said, man, this is an interesting scripture based on what you've been teaching. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it, man. Well, you know, that's fascinating that it says that we can either be like, and it, it, it says two Adams. Right. We can be like the first Adam who was from the dirt, and the dirt refers to the earthly nature. Right. Or we can be like the second Adam who was from heaven, and that means that we'd have a heavenly nature. So I guess really what we're talking about this time when we're talking about dirt and that scripture yeah. are two atoms. And which mm -hmm. atom are we going to be like? But you know another thing that's fascinating about the two atoms? Tell me. They each had to make decisions in a garden. Yeah. Two gardens. Yeah, that's right. And they each had to make a decision about a tree. Wow, I didn't think about it like that. Wow. Man, that's, so yeah, yeah, yeah. two atoms, okay. two gardens, and two trees. The Bible speaks of two atoms. We're familiar with the atom of creation, man made from the dust. Well, the Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. It says that he too is a new creation, man made from heaven. But there are other parallels as well. Both atoms were placed in gardens the first Adam in the Garden of Eden, and the second Adam was placed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And both Adams in their separate gardens had to make separate decisions that would affect the lives of many because both of them had to make a decision about a tree. The first Adam was placed in Eden, which the scriptures call the Garden of God. And God did more than just place him in the garden. God actually put him in charge of everything in that garden. God made him responsible for everything growing and multiplying and increasing. And God told the first Adam that he could eat freely from anything that was in that garden except of one tree. And this only tree of the vast number of trees in the garden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because until this point, Adam only knew good and prosperity. He had unfettered fellowship with God, but he didn't have any familiarity with evil. And like a loving parent, 
God wanted to protect him from experiencing evil and all of its horrible outcomes. But just like children who believe that their parents don't know anything or that they're trying to keep them from enjoying life, Adam chose to disobey his father's directives. He listened to that voice that said, Ooh, see how good it looks, or ooh, it tastes good, or it feels good. Go ahead, it won't hurt. And Adam ate from that tree. Adam's disobedience, it exposed him to things that he never would have imagined. The experience of evil brought with him a sense of disconnectedness, a sense of separation. It flooded his body with anxiety and fear, and his soul felt loss, the loss of peace and an emptiness that he had never felt before. And this defiance, it introduced him to feelings like sorrow and sadness and shame. The scripture says that the first Adam, when he realized that he was naked, he became ashamed. Now, he had been naked the whole time. He wasn't concerned about hiding anything, but sin brought a shame. And shame says we have something to hide. Shame says cover up so that they can't see. Shame says don't let them find out what you've done. Now, this first Adam, because of his revolt against God, for the first time, he felt guilt. But guilt is different from shame. Guilt says, there's something wrong with what I did. Shame says, there's something wrong with who I am. Here Adam is, made in the image of God. And he's lost the ability to see himself the way God made him to be. Shame made him feel like he was unworthy to be an image bearer. Shame didn't just drive him into hiding. Shame also drove him away from his purpose. So the first Adam, he lost the garden because he chose the wrong tree. Let's consider another garden, Gethsemane. Life-changing decisions had to be made here as well. And the second Adam, Jesus, just like the first Adam, had to choose between the peace of a garden or the consequences of a tree. The first tree took the first Adam from his destiny, while the second tree was the key to Jesus' destiny. And just like the first Adam, Jesus had unfettered fellowship with his Father, and he had only known good. But a tree was set before him that would introduce him to the anguish and the suffering of sin. This tree would separate him from his Father. So why then would he choose this tree? Because the only way to reverse the consequences of the first tree would be by the second Adam choosing the second tree. Now, unlike the first Adam, Jesus knew the pain that would follow from choosing this tree. That's why he begged his father to make him not have to do it, to come up with an alternate plan. You see, Jesus wouldn't simply suffer after eating from this tree like the first Adam. He would have to die on this tree, which was the cross. Actually, it would have been less complicated if death were his only punishment. But first, he would have to taste every evil and feel every agony that the first Adam and the first tree caused. Listen to how the prophet Isaiah describes it. He says that Jesus was a man of sorrow. He was well acquainted with grief. He took our suffering and he carried our pains. And he was wounded because of our transgressions. 
Jesus was bruised because of our iniquities. And he was punished so that we could have peace. And he took the lashes of the whip so that we could be healed. And here's the catch. This wasn't happening because he had disobeyed his father like the first Adam. This was happening because he was willing to submit to the plan of his father that was all about restoring relationship that had been lost with the first Adam and the first tree. And so here's Jesus. Even though he hadn't disobeyed his father, his father was laying on him the disobediences that we had committed. And his father had him nailed to the tree. And on this tree, Jesus had to experience the deepest separation that's caused by sin. Having both his father abandoning him and having his God turn his back on him. But Jesus submitted to the torment of this tree so that he could undo every consequence that Adam caused sin guilt, and shame. Jesus was stripped completely naked and he experienced the worst shame imaginable. Remember what we said about shame? Shame says that there's something wrong with me. Well, on that tree, Jesus takes on himself everything that's wrong with me and you. And then he gives us everything that's right with him. And now, I live by grace. You live by grace. And grace says that we're new. Grace says that there's nothing wrong with us. Grace says that we're in His likeness and that we bear His image and that we have nothing to be ashamed of. So, where shame sends us into hiding. Now grace says we can come out of hiding and I can approach the presence of God with boldness and without shame because we've been healed. But as wonderful as all of this is, while my wounds have been healed, I still have scars. Thank God that we've been healed. But why do we hide our scars? It's because when people see scars, they want to know what happened. And that question, it triggers memories of the things that we're ashamed of, our past pains, our mishaps, our failings or our fallings. And see in my head, yeah, I believe what the Bible says about me. I believe that I'm brand new and that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ and that God is not holding anything against me. But if you look at my scars, you might ask, how could that happen to a Christian? Well, I know because there's some things that have happened to me that I don't think are supposed to happen because I try to live as a believer. But because they did happen or when they do happen, I feel flawed. And then I listen to shame that tells me to hide because hiding is easier than explaining. And if I do have to explain, I feel stupid or I doubt myself. I feel like my scars came as a result of my failings or my defects. And if you knew my failings, maybe you wouldn't respect me or listen to me anymore. If you knew, I I'm afraid that you'd only focus on my scars and not my person or my purpose. But because shame makes us afraid of rejection, it's just easier to hide. Now, I don't have a problem telling you about my scars if they came from a sickness or physical healing, because then it becomes a part of my testimony. And, you know, I can say, oh, you know, the Lord healed me. But I can't tell you about my scars if they came from my own personal failings, because there's no glory in that. Scars, they're ugly. And so if I live in the beauty of holiness, why doesn't he just make my scars go away? Well, the truth is our scars are more than just bad reminders. 
Jesus had scars too. And his scars didn't go away just because he was resurrected. Remember when Thomas doubted that he had been risen? You know how Jesus convinced him? He showed Thomas his scars. He invited Thomas to touch the scars from the most painful and the most shameful event in his life. Jesus didn't hide his scars. Jesus used his scars to inspire faith. Hebrews 12 and 2 tells us how Jesus dealt with shame and the second tree. It says that he rejected the shame and that he endured the cross. And he did it by not focusing on either the shame or the cross, but by focusing on his purpose and the joy that was going to result from his obedience. And we give too much attention to the wrong stuff. And we hide our scars to hide our imperfections. But we should show our scars to prove his grace. So when people want to know if this thing is real, I want to challenge you to invite them to touch your scars and to let them know that your story is proof of the grace of God. Two atoms, two gardens, and two trees. And because the second Adam, Jesus, picked the right tree, we've been made alive and we have access to the garden. But now we still have to choose. Is shame going to cause us to hide among the leaves? Or are we going to, because of the grace of God, show our scars and help someone else's faith? I keep fighting voices in my mind and say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. And
You'll have every failure, God. You'll have every victory. I am so glad I decided to come to the park today. I learned so much. I know you did too. Now, Pastor Hunt taught on the two trees, but there's actually a third tree. It was mentioned in the book of Revelations. It is the tree of life. And what Pastor Hunt has been trying to do is to prepare us to eat from the tree of life, to give us the, the tools and the skills necessary to live life here on earth to the fullest. We are not just abundant grace, we want to have abundant life, all right? So with that in mind, I would love for you to sow into our ministry to help us to sustain what we're doing so that we can ensure that we have a high quality teaching opportunity for you each and every week, all right? The ways to give are on the screen. Your gift, your contribution, your donation to us helps us to sustain that going forward so that we can be the beacon of light and hope in our community. Listen, I want to thank you personally for spending a little time with us while we dealt with this teaching. It would really make me happy if you would like and subscribe to our channel, if you would share this teaching to anybody that you know that could benefit from it. Now, if you're like me, I have plenty of people in my circle that need to know about these two trees and how to deal with these issues that we have in life. That's what I love about what we're doing here at Abundant Grace Fellowship. We are redefining Sundays by bringing the word to life in a real and relevant way. So share this teaching. Again, this is Brother Bobby and Abundant Grace Fellowship saying, Grace to you.